So my name is Jason Prem. I am the co-founder uh, of an organization called Our Research. We used to be called Impact Story, but we changed our name. And Our Research is a nonprofit that builds infrastructure for open science. A lot of people interested in infrastructure for open science here, which is exciting. I'm glad to see so many people here to talk about infrastructure and metadata. That's one of the things I love about Force is that it's a place where that's a thing people like. I love that. Um, and y'all don't instantly go to sleep as soon as I just say those words. So. Um, who needs scholarly metadata? I think I'm preaching a little bit to the choir here, so hopefully we're not going to have to spend a lot of time like talking about why we would need this. Um, but I, we want to try and think of a couple examples of why this would matter. Um, a lot of times researchers, of course, are interested in their impact in one sense or another. That's something that our roots at, at our research go pretty deep with. Um, we both started out as researchers, and we find there's a lot of places where people want to know our impact, and that can be a lot of different things, right? Of course, it could be my citation impact is a really common one. It could be where I've published. Maybe that's not so healthy for the scholarly ecosystem, but it is a thing that people really want to know. Um, and then we could even look beyond that at things like altmetrics and stuff like that, right? So that's an area where people want to know the research. Uh, sorry, an area where people uh, want the, the metadata um, in order to track that kind of thing. Uh, we get a lot of, com of questions from the university research office uh, of different universities saying, well, we want to do the same thing about tracking impact uh, at the university level, and we'd like to compare ourselves to our peers. That's something um, that, again, like is maybe there's some good and some bad uh, associated with that, like this sort of a lot of people have uh, expressed concern that this is sort of this neoliberalism uh, that's, that's creeping into the academy and making it so that maybe um, – the, the substance of what's, of what's being researched is being lost in favor of the numbers. I think that's an interesting argument, and maybe it's a, something uh, we can talk about later in the, in the Q&A. But um, there's also, I think, a good side to it. Um, I was, we were talking the other night. I mean, I think the substantive type of research evaluation is maybe a little bit more susceptible to who knows whom, right? Like, if, if we're not having any kind of objective measures associated with, with, with what we're doing, I'm just saying, well, this is my opinion. Um, my opinion is maybe a little bit more easily biased by factors that aren't specifically about the work. So I, I think there should be a balance. And so um, without getting too deep in that, we can at least say that there's a lot of interest uh, from the research office about um, tracking uh, scholarly items. And if you try to do this, you know that a lot of times you run into these problems of missing metadata. Um, a library collections manager is another one that uh, we hear a lot from. We hear a lot of people saying, hey, we want to try and figure out uh, for our library collection what we should subscribe to and what we can afford to not subscribe to. And they're often asking for different kinds of metadata for that. Um, a funder is often wanting to track their impact, of course. They put a lot of money out. They want to make sure they're getting something back or the world is getting something back for that. And then a lot of times we, we hear things from uh, regular people with the initiative we're doing called Get the Research, funded by the Arcadia Fund. Um, we're trying to get open access out there. Uh, to where it can make a difference in people's actual decision making, whether about their health or about other sorts of things. And a lot of times they want to make a decision about, is this a credible paper? And that's something, again, metadata could help us with. So I'm, I'm talking about metadata in kind of a vague way. Let's see if we can like zoom in a little bit more to say, what, what, am I, what do I mean when I talk about metadata? Well, if we could s separate it into a number of different sections. And, and um, I was just talking to, to Ginny uh, Hendricks from Crossref and telling her, and I will tell her the same thing I told you guys is, y'all know a lot more about this than I do in aggregate, for sure. So that's why I'm trying to leave a lot of time for questions so we can kind of dig into this a little bit more. But this is my take, uh, relatively early take, on what kind of metadata if we're going to try and like lump it all together in the, the cleanest way we could. Uh, we've got products, and there's a lot of different kind of scholarly products. Um, I'm not... I'm not going to list all of them. I kind of like to think of there as being sort of a holy trinity of like the three main scholarly products of you start with the data set, right? That's where kind of we're kind of doing research. We're trying to start with the data. Uh, from the data, uh, you run some kind of a algorithm on that, right? You do something with the data. Increasingly, that's in software, right? Like maybe in the olden days, it was just a pen and paper or whatever. But now it is increasingly that software. And then finally, once you've got your data, you do some kind of processing of the data, then you finally get some kind of a publication uh, in narrative or, or story form, right? Like a paper. Um, so I kind of think of that as, as the whole training. So we got these three kinds of products and then some other ones, some, some smaller kinds as well. Um, we got institutions. Um, institution is not, I think, a fundamental entity. Like an institution is just an aggregation of people, right? Like, but for the purposes of a lot of decision making that we're interested in, it is very useful to think of an institution as sort of a first class entity, right? Because the institutions um, carry a lot of weight uh, in the system. So institutions, we've got funders. Uh, again, same thing, right? The funder, of course, is 
not not inconsequential if we're trying to get anything done. Um, we got the researchers themselves who are, who are doing the, the authorships, and then we've got links. And I think links is you can kind of argue whether or not that's an entity or not. Um, but I, I think it's it's helpful to kind of model that as an entity, right? So the idea is you kind of got all of these things at the top. These first four, these are all sort of entities in this graph, and then there's links that are connecting all of these together. And there's different kinds of links, right? So um, again, I don't want to belabor this point, but you know, a product could be linked to a funder via a funded by relationship, right? A paper could be linked to another paper via a citation relationship, right? And so there's a lot of different types of links we could have, but fundamentally we just got a bunch of nodes in the network, we got a bunch of links. Um, to, before I dig into the, the different kinds of, of these links, um, the gist of what we're trying to do with the thing that my talk is about, right? This one big database to rule them all, um, is to say, is, is it possible now, I'm gonna scooch back a little bit, is it possible today to build this whole graph, all these things that I'm talking about, all these like cool little entities and the links between them and stuff like that, is it possible to do that with open data today? And by doing it with open data, could we then give that whole access to that whole graph away for free? And if we could give access to that whole graph away for free, then would it be possible for all of these use cases that I discussed in my first class, all of those to be solved without having to pay for some kind of a product? And the nice thing about that is if they don't have to pay for access to some kind of a product, they can share all the results, right? And people can build tools on that open graph. And that's kind of the goal that we have in mind is to say, let's bring all of those, um, all of these, uh, all of these entities and all these links all into one place and then make that whole graph available for free so people could build stuff on it. And I kind of like to think of it, um, you know, as, a, as an, uh, I think the citation case is sort of a good example. Uh, if you kind of think of the progression, right? Like when you start making things, you start making them by hand, it's, it, doesn't, it doesn't scale very well, right? So if I'm making sweaters, um, I make one sweater, another sweater, another sweater. And if you want a million sweaters, it's gonna take me one sweater times one million. It's just take a really long time. Then I can come up with like maybe a factory, right? And in the factory, I can make the sweaters much, much more quickly, right? I can make them in parallel. I can, I can save a lot of time. And then finally from there, the next step from there is maybe I could do some kind of an electronic thing, right? An electronic sweater doesn't work very well. So it wasn't a very good metaphor. <laughs> this is what happens when you think your talk is in two hours and it's actually now. But I think the citation example is a really good one. In the early days of citation mining, uh, Eugene Garfield, he did all this by hand, right? He looked through individual papers and he wrote them all down. And eventually Web of Science was created and they, they still do it by hand, right? It's a bunch of human people looking at papers, reading them and well, maybe typing now, but like they, they manually actually look at the thing and write it down. So a number of years after that, Scopus comes along, right? And Scopus comes along and says, hey, we can do this instead of manually, we can do it automatically. We can save a lot of time and money. And Scopus does that, and they're able to create a much bigger database for much cheaper. My argument is I think there's a third step to this kind of revolution, and that is not only can we start with doing it, so we can start with doing it, like I said, on, kind of on paper, that's real slow. We can move to electronic, that's a lot faster. But then the kind of third generation is we can do the electronic free version, right? The electronic open version by using open data sources and open data sets and putting those together we can go from the cost of web of science, which is super expensive, cost of Scopus, which is like more, ex which is less expensive, but still expensive, to the cost of something that is essentially free or so cheap that it can be given away. So to do that, we need to have lots of free sources to put together in the first place. And so I wanna kind of walk through these categories right quick, just to show some of the examples of the free sources that we think we can use. So for instance, um, in the case of papers, of course we use Crossref, we're huge fans of Crossref. There's about 110 million articles now, adding about 10 million every year. Crossref doesn't have every paper, it's got a lot of papers. We can use the Unpaywall database. Um, that tells us information about the papers and also information about other like sources where you could get the data uh, or the, the content of those papers. Um, I'll talk about Unpaywall a little bit more in a second. We've got 5,000, five to 8,000, depending on how you count them, academic, uh, institutional repositories in the world. All these repositories have lots of information from individual um, researchers who have uploaded it to the repository, lots of manuscripts, there's some gray literature in there, there's alternate copies of lots of papers, so we've got that. We've got the Microsoft Academic Graph database, which you're gonna hear me talking about a couple of times, which is a, a, a project from um, Microsoft Research that has lots of really, uh, I think, exciting possibilities. It's free 
Open is, I think, a little bit trickier because the licensing is is not uh, as unambiguous as I might like, but it's uh, available data, which is pretty cool. Um, so we got products uh, for papers, we got products for data, and for data, we're looking at, uh, I think, a lot of different sources for data availability, but data site is one of the best ones, one of the biggest ones. Um, and then for software, we're currently building a database for software um, that's funded by the Sloan Foundation uh, that's using the unpayable data set. We're scrolling through uh, several million papers and we're extracting all of the software mentions from those papers and then we're going to put that in a data set along with the preferred citation for that um, software. So the idea would be we'd kind of have like a cross ref of, um, of, of academic software projects and there would be some similarities and some differences but the idea would be you could have kind of one database where it'd have all this software. So that's, those are all free sources for product information. Um, I mentioned on paywall, just a quick, uh, for those of y'all who may not be familiar with it, the idea is kind of like a card catalog of all the open access in the world. So we take 5,000 green open repositories, we bring those all in. We take 50,000 journals, we bring those all in, and we mesh that with metadata from Crossref, put all that together so that for any journal, uh, for any journal article, we can tell you if there's an open copy of that somewhere. And that's pretty powerful because first of all, a lot of times people are looking for open copies. And second of all, it's powerful because we can use that open full text. Like I said, we can mine that open full text and find new stuff. So I mentioned uh, these different entities, right? So we've got papers, we've also got institutions. Um, Grid was an earlier project uh, from Digital Science that we are currently uh, bringing in house. It's pretty neat. It's a, it's a um, a, an identifier for every single institution, which I think is pretty great. Um, Roar is sort of the newer updated version. Uh, it's kind of started with some of that, but it's a fully open uh, kind of consortium, which I think is really cool. And then Microsoft Academic Graph is also finding um, institutional affiliation. So what we can do is we can say, looking at all the, look at these three sources, we can do a pretty good job of saying for a particular person, what institution are they from? And that asks, that answers a lot of questions. If, for instance, for a uh, given institution, I want to try and find out, hey, for my institution, what's my impact, right? I got to first of all say for my institution, what people are researchers there? And then for those researchers, I got to figure out what did they publish? And then for what they publish, I got to figure out how cited it is, right? So that's one kind of piece in that puzzle. For funders, Crossref has got funder information. We're going to be using that. That's not as, uh, as comprehensive uh, as I would like by quite a long shot, but it's growing, which is great. And um, there's already some information there that we can use. Um, researchers, we've got, of course, ORCID, um, which is, you know, again, like not as comprehensive as I might like, but it's a growing initiative, which is great. What we're doing, because ORCID support in Crossref is a lot more limited than we would like. So a lot of Crossref records do have an ORCID ID associated with the paper, but the majority of them don't. And so if you wanted to say, hey, this researcher, what have they written? And you want to do it in a fully open, like uh, fully open tool chain. It's not very. Uh, you don't get very many papers, right? You just get a lot of information about, like, oh, your your university has only published, you know, twelve papers this year, right? Because that's twelve papers with orchids associated with them. I'm making up the number twelve. Um, so Microsoft Academic Graph is really helpful for us uh, to linking that uh, to kind of bridging that gap because Microsoft Academic has done a lot of automated uh, author assignments. So they've tried to look and say, you know, this particular, there's always name ambiguity problems, right? If you don't have a, a persistent ID, so they're trying to say, oh, this John Smith, you know, are they the same as this John Smith? And there's a lot of algorithmic ways you can try and determine that by saying, well, this John Smith writes about nothing but woodchucks, but this uh, John Smith writes about nothing but the death penalty. And like those two are probably not the same, except for that really frustrating woodchuck that he just needs to die. But other than that, it's probably not the same John Smith. So, um, what we can do is we can kind of create a crosswalk between that Microsoft Academic Graph stuff and the ORCID stuff, put that together, and hopefully get a little bit better than either of them um, alone. And then finally, Crossref does have some authorship information as well. And we're throwing that in, uh, in as well. So that's the researcher side of what we're doing. We're trying to kind of like uh, aggregate all these different, these, these three different open ones. Uh, and then finally for links, uh, which is citations between papers, really important. I've always kind of argued that the citation graph is maybe one of the most valuable commodities that humanity has ever created. And the reason for that is because this is, every citation is the opinion of one of the world's leading experts on this particular topic about what things should go with other things. And what's knowledge other than deciding what things should go with other things, right? The citation graph is basically the distillation of 
the history of ideas throughout humanity. And so I think it's a really valuable resource, uh, unsurprisingly, because it's valuable. It a lot of times costs a lot of money for access. So it's really cool that there is these free sources starting to emerge. So Microsoft, I'm a, a Microsoft Academic Graph is a really good one. I'm going to say MAG from now on because it's easier to say. So MAG is a really good one. Uh, and what's neat is the coverage of MAG is very comparable to the commercial citation databases, uh, quite, quite similar um, to Scopus, a uh, little bit less than Google Scholar, a little bit more than Web of Science. Um, cross of citations is uh, another source. So uh, publishers deposit their metadata uh, with Crossref and they deposit the references a lot of times and those references can then be made open via the Crossref API. And so I4OC is an initiative to try and get as many of those references openly available in the Crossref API as possible. They're making great progress. They got 59% of them and that's continuing to grow. So that's another great source of citations. There's a number of different PubMed in, uh, initiatives. Uh, some of them using a paywall, which is pretty cool, to mine the full text of papers, extract the citations, then make those available. Um, so there's a couple different ones on those, and we're going to be using those. And finally, there's an open citation initiative, which is similarly mining full text. It's a smaller corpus, but it's a, it's a pretty neat one. So we're going to bring all those in together as well. Um, this is a, we don't have much time for, but a, an example of the coverage of Google Scholar, um, Scopus, Web of Science, and Microsoft Academic Graph, which is labeled MA in the graph. Um, and on my notes, I have the source Hartzing, I think. Anvil Hartzig, Hartzing, I think is pronunciation. Yeah, thank you. Um, a paper that she wrote. So it's, it's a reasonable coverage, which I think is really cool. It's not necessarily just like, you know, we only got 10, 10 cents on the dollar for every, every Scopus citation or whatever. Okay, so show me something that works. So I've kind of, kind of gone quickly through this, and the, con, the abstract for this talk promised a lot of things, like, oh, we've brought all this together. Realistically, it turns out that we thought we might have all of this done by force. It's not all done. We've made some good progress, which I've tried to touch on in a couple places. But what I would like to do is show you what we have done. Uh, even though we don't have all of this data in one place, we do have enough of it in one place to support some pretty cool project and to support analysis, uh, support um, solving some of these use cases, these user stories that we talked about. And I am going to show you a live demo of that right now, which hopefully will work. Always fun to try the live demo. So what use case, sorry, what use case we're trying to solve here? This is the use case of the collections librarian. So there's an interesting, just a little background on this is a lot of librarians um, are experiencing financial difficulty and have been for the last decade or so. Uh, publishers sell journal subscriptions to libraries. Libraries buy journal subscriptions to give them the reader. That's kind of how a system works. Open access is starting to change that, but for the most part, there's still a lot of money being uh, exchanged hands on buying and selling subscriptions. And these subscriptions are typically bundled into a, what's called a big deal. So kind of like uh, when you have a cable package, like maybe you only want to watch ESPN, but you have to buy the whole cable package that includes HDTV and a bunch of other channels maybe you don't want. You got to buy them all together. The big deal is the same kind of thing. If you want to buy a journal subscription or two or 10, a lot of times the publisher says, well, why don't you instead buy 2000? And we can give you a great deal per journal, but it's still really expensive overall. And so that's the situation a lot of librarians are looking at. They're saying, well, we would just kind of want the individual things, but we don't want to lose uh, subscription access for our faculty. They're going to be really mad at us. They're not going to be able to do their jobs. So we're faced with this problem with these big deals, where, which are very expensive and they keep going up, are not exactly what we want, but we don't know exactly how to buy the things that we do want because we're missing some of the metadata about what the impact of those individual things are, and in particular, what the open access percentage of those individual things are, those individual journals, right? A particular journal may be largely open access. The publisher's not probably gonna tell you that, right? If it's a gold open access journal, of course you know. But what if a lot of the content in the journal has been self-archived and is available in a green repository somewhere, the publisher's not exactly announcing that to you at the, at the negotiation, right? So as a, as a librarian, if you can come to that look at negotiation and say, well, I don't want the big deal anymore, and I would like to instead subscribe to these 10 journals, and this 10 over here I'm not going to subscribe to because I don't need them, and this other 10 I need, but they're mostly open access, so I don't have to buy them. Right? That's kind of the dream, and that's something that a lot of librarians are coming to us and asking for all the time. And there's a lot of money involved in this, right? So a mid-size uh, American um, you know, like say state university, so we're working a lot of these, like might spend $2 million 
on their subscriptions for one publisher. Their Elsevier subscription might be about like two million bucks. That's not an unusual amount. And that's, that's a yearly annual kind of subscription. There's a lot of money changing hands. And what brought us into this is not so much because we want to save librarians money, although that's nice. It's more because the mission for our research is all about increasing the openness, right? Of data, openness of, um, of papers, openness of software, all this stuff. We want this totally open graph. And we thought, what would be the most powerful way to do that other than by making it so there's no money in selling closed access, right? If, if we can tell publishers, well, you can keep being closed access, but no one's going to pay for it. Or you're going to lose money. Well, they'll flip to open access right away. So that's kind of the, that's kind of the idea of what got us into this. So let me show you this thing. Um, this is, let's pretend that I'm a librarian and uh, this is all real data from a, like I said, mid-size American state university. Um, and when I look at this data, you can kind of see right off the bat uh, these little shapes, um, this little square situation, and then you can see all these little journals. So this is currently organized by the, um, and this is like, I was working on this last night, so this is hot off the presses. So if it's a little slow or buggy, I hope you'll bear with me. Um, so these are the journals that this university subscribes to. There's about, uh, let's see. 1700 uh, journals total that they're subscribing to. So you can see that here. This is all of my journals. And the way that I'm obtaining all these journals right now is ILL, instant li instant, uh, interlibrary loan. And so the assumption of this right now is that I have canceled my subscription and I no longer am subscribing to any of these 1700 journals from this major publisher that, uh, can I say the publisher? Yeah, it says right there, it's Elsevier. So this is an Elsevier, <laughs> Elsevier published journals. If I immediately canceled my subscription right now, this is what I would be looking at. I would be looking at $800,000 or so worth of interlibrary loan fees. And we can figure those interlibrary loan fees up with a bunch of kind of settings. These are over here on the, on the left, this little settings area. And so I'm assuming that about 0.5 or 50% of um, times that a user can't find a particular resource, they'll ILL it. They'll ask for the interlibrary loan. That's a little bit high, but we're trying to be kind of conservative. So that gives us, we can kind of estimate the cost, which is kind of neat but it's not necessarily a game changer or something like that. Um, what we can do though, is we can start to say, what is the impact of open access on that cost? And how can you save money using that impact of open access? So one example is this journal at the top. This one's called Cell. It's really, of course, super famous journal, very high impact. This is their um, downloads. So they've got 40,000 downloads per year. And I'm gonna expand this one just so we can take a little bit of a better peek on it. So we can look at different types of usage. So they've got downloads from counter. They get those statistics from the publisher. I'm gonna zoom in a little bit. Um, they've got institutional citations. So from this university, uh, people who work faculty from the university uh, cite sell sometimes, and it looks like 53 times last year, people from this university cited work in that in that particular um, journal. We've got also institutional authorship. So this is how many times people from this university authored something in this particular journal. So that's kind of our sense of like, oh, this is the impact of the journal. And then we can also kind of look at the price of the journal. So we can say, well, there's two models of prices that I could use. I could either subscribe to it or I could get ILL. And if I'm going to subscribe, uh, there's no delayed, uh, not really any delayed access at all. Everything's on, under the subscription. But for ILL, there's two different kinds of delayed access. There's the ILL itself, like if I actually ask for the item via interlibrary loan and I get it back, that's going to be 6%. And other delayed, which is maybe you ask a colleague or you... Um, uh, you know, I can has PDF, Twitter feed or whatever, like other ways of getting the article or maybe 6%. The key here with this model is that you're going to get it one way or another, right? That's an important part of what we're trying to say is that this, if someone needs the, needs the, um, the resource, they're going to get it. And so the question isn't just, you know, do my, re do my faculty get resources or not? The question is instead, do they get them quickly or do they get them less quickly? And then this is sort of the, the most useful, I think, meat of the application, which is this area of how much is coming from your back catalog, from open access, and then ResearchGate we kind of put in as a separate category. Some people might call it open access. I think it's maybe a little bit um, in between, so we kind of called it out by itself. So we make these estimates about what is open access, back catalog, and ResearchGate. And depending on the, um, 
depending on the journal, the estimates might be really different. And you can kind of see these estimates on this little chart. So we can show this is your open access this year, this year, this year, and so forth. And for other articles though, for other journals, Computers and Human Behavior is a little bit more interesting one. We can see that your, um, your open access is staying pretty calm, uh, staying pretty um, the same from year to year, but your back catalog unsurprisingly is going way down, right? So 47% of your uses are back catalog to start with, but in subsequent years, it's less and less because people are wanting to read um, contemporaneous new articles, right? So they're not as, as five years from now, they're not necessarily going to be reading as much from the back catalog. So we can model all that. The data from this comes from uh, data we drew from the unpaywall web extension and data that we get from the libraries themselves. And so these models aren't just kind of our opinions, they're based on the actual download curves on a journal level. So some journals, um, maybe the downloads disappear more or less instantly, right? People read the first years of stuff and then subsequent years they don't care about. Other ones like maybe philosophy, right? People still read Socrates and stuff. Um, so that's, that tends to last a little bit longer. Oh, I'm almost out of time, thank you. Um, yeah, so thank you for letting me know that I'm almost out of time. Um, so let me show you two or three real quick things that we can use, that we can do with this data. I can automatically with this magic wand thing, find my cheapest price. So when I find my cheapest price, I'm actually going to subscribe to sell because I can get the subscription for cheaper than I can for the ILL once I factor in all of these numbers. Um, or I could say, okay, let me spend the same $2.2 million that I was spending before. And then I can see what sort of access I get then. So this is my green open access, this is my subscription, my teal subscription all of a sudden gets a lot bigger because I'm subscribing more. What's cool is then I can say, okay, well, I'm getting 87% of my uses and I'm on spending 100% of the money, that's maybe not such a great deal. Maybe instead I should do my like automatic one and with the automatic, I can get 75% of my uses for only 36% of the price. So there's lots more to get into about that. What's cool about it is it's all open data it's all based on these open citation sources, on open affiliation sources, um, on open, uh, open access sources, on paywall. And so none of this has to be stored behind a paywall. Everybody can compare this with everybody else and they can kind of give and, and, uh, give and get it freely, which we're pretty excited about. And that's all the time I have. Thank you very much for your patience and I'm sorry again for my lack of preparation. Hey, Jason. Hey. Um, I was wondering, you've done a lot of work in the past with looking at software in other places. Here you just talked about software from papers. Are you going to be incorporating the previous work that you've done in software from software and things like that, those, those kind of mentions as well? Yes. As you can see, I was already overburdened for time, so I, it was, uh, yeah, that, absolutely, yeah, definitely. Hi, Joe Haberman here for Africa Archive. I have a few questions. I try to keep it short. First of all, are you sponsored by Microsoft? Because you made a big point about MAG. Second, um, I'm sorry, it's a bit critical, but I try to try and be constructive here. So I'm hoping for satisfying answers. Um, what about, are you considering politically and economically embargoed countries in your analysis and designing your products? Because that's a big problem, especially since you're based in America. You're talking in Europe to many European scientists or sci research affiliates here. How, like what about regional ownership of research output? And what if you centralize now all those um, research outputs onto American grounds? And how does that go together with regional ownership for research? Um, also talking for Africa here because I'm trying to help and build an African academic open infrastructure. Um, in your list of um, um, search engines, you mentioned Mac, Google Scholar, Scopus, Web of Science. What about base search, open knowledge maps, and Dio, like the director of open access journals? Can you include those in the list of comparing? Um, because like the, mention, the ones you mentioned are not global databases for research output, like by default. They just can't be because they're biased. Um, there's a hashtag, don't leave it to Google. Maybe you need a hashtag now for don't leave it to Microsoft. I'm just saying that. 
And isn't it there a need for designing flexible standards that work across regions and disciplines? And can we do data mining under commons principles? I'm done. Thanks. Thanks. Well, I think that is unfortunately all the time uh, that I have. <laughs> <laughs> Those are great questions. Uh, we're Canadian, not American, for, for what it's worth. And uh, yeah, and uh, no, we're not sponsored by Microsoft, but, uh, but we do think they've built something that's very useful, and we appreciate that they're giving away for free. I, I oversee collections in a library, yeah. and I want that tool. So tell me how to get it. <laughs> awesome. Talk to me, and we will get it for you. It's officially launching in a month, and it'll look much better than the nonsense I just saw. Just showed. All right. Thank you. Thank you all very much for your forbearance. I appreciate it.